Good morning. It is wonderful to see all of you. Happy May. I cannot believe we are already here, um, but indeed we are. So we are just glad that you're here with us this morning to worship. Greg is continuing his series called Beware of the Thing. Last week he kicked that off, so if you missed it, you can go to our website and check out that message. Um, and today he is here again, and we're going to talk about hideouts. Um, but we're going to sing first and worship God. So would you stand and lift your voice as we all join in song together? Praise be a weapon that comes. 
Every week here at Westerville Christian Church, we take time to come to the communion table and participate in taking the elements together. If you're a guest here this morning, we invite you to take communion with us as long as you believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's hard to believe that Easter was two weeks ago. It feels like we have all this anticipation up to this huge, big celebration day, and then if it's you're anything like me, it's just kind of back to normal routine. And so I wanted to urge each of us this morning to pause, to remember the excitement, to remember the promise of Christ's resurrection and what that means for our lives and how we are called to live into that same resurrection power and that same hope every single day. So as you take the elements this morning, thank God for his son and thank him for the hope that we have in Christ. Let's pray. God, this morning we come before you in the middle of spring when we're reminded that things that have long seemed dead are just now coming to life again. God, we're reminded of the newness as we see the blooms on the trees. God, remind us that even when things seem so far beyond repair, God, new growth and new life is still laying beneath the surface. God, help us to be agents of your hope and the truth of your resurrection everywhere we go. That we see people for who they are as you see them. And we not hesitate to take the opportunity to share the hope of Jesus. God, we thank you for his body broken and his blood shed. As we take these elements, we pause and remember with hearts of gratitude. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to the month of May, and uh, welcome to Westworld Christian Church. My name is Greg Bondurant, and this is Adrian Schonkweiler. And Adrian and her husband, Matt, they've been a part of the family for quite some time. They have two children, Emma and Paige, 
And uh, Adrian was part of our Fearless Stewardship Campaign, part of the lead team uh, this last fall, and I've asked her to just start my, my message with a word of prayer. So would you give Adrian a little round of applause, please welcome her. So. Will you pray with me? Father God, we come to you this morning as Westerville Christian Church, Lord, we just sang these words that fear cannot survive when we praise you. So we just want to start by praising you, God. It was just one year ago that we sat in this room and started conversations about this campaign. We didn't even know what it would be called, but we just started conversations. And here we are one year later, God, and all we can do is praise you for the money that's already been received, God, for the pledges and the money that is yet to come. It's all you. And Lord, we just come before you today. Um, and we ask for guidance for these next steps. Lord, we pray for, just for the elders and the leaders of the church, for wisdom in their decisions. And just that anything that we do, Lord, with this money, that it be used to glorify you. That it can be used to create places of hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Give her another round of applause. Thank you, Adrian, for doing that. So again, with today being the first Sunday in May, so we typically do this. The first Sunday, we try to give a little updates in regards to what's happening with the Fearless Campaign. And so I thought I'd do a little bit of that today just to make you aware. So the Fearless Campaign, really the main, main priority for all of us is to do our absolute best to reach this current generation. We want to do our best to reach Gen Z. So we're really looking at people 18 to 30. Do we want to reach everyone? Yes, absolutely we do. But the fact is, for a lot of young people, they're, off, they're far away from God. And we want to draw them in to see Jesus. So this campaign really focuses on three main priorities. The first one is really remodeling this, our worship center. We also want to do everything we can for live stream. We want to improve our live stream. Everyone watching online, it's an absolute delight to be able to worship God with you. And we also want to do some things within our lobby. All right. So some of those changes are really going to start happening probably like in the month of June. You'll see some actual tangible changes. The second priority is WC Cares. I mean, this is really what we are all about, man. We care about the community. We want to help us. So we want to have a dedicated space in our building for WC Cares, whether that is a building we build or something that we remodel, because we want to keep packing food and give it out to the schools. That's through Friday Fair. We want to still keep collecting clothes and bring them to the wardrobe and then just distribute them out to people that need it the most, all right? So these, these priorities are high for us. This third one in particular, though, we also want to create a mental health counseling center within our office complex that's on the college road side of the building. We want to do this. I mean, there's a lot of folks, a lot of people are struggling. They're struggling. So we want to be able to bring help and hope to people who are hurting the most. And if we can do that within a mental counseling you know, concept, we feel, really feel like we'll be doing a great thing uh, for people and to honor Jesus. All right? So let's look at some numbers again. So this is some numbers. Some of this you might be familiar with. But again, our capital campaign totaled $2,604,095. And as of right now, money that has actually been brought in that we currently have on hand is 576 $6,335.88. And I would just say I cannot thank you enough. I cannot thank you enough for giving, for choosing to give. It's, it's just tremendous. Now, let's look at this next thing. So we um, brought in, so bids, we, uh, we took bids out for the project. The bids totaled $3.8 million. And let's just say a, a lot of this has to do with inflation. So inflation is killing everybody. <laughs> I mean, inflation is really rough, and so what we didn't think, we, we didn't think it would be that expensive, but it's, there's no doubt inflation did this. So our elders recently at our last meeting, they approved a construction loan of $4.4 million, just so we can be, you know, there's some wiggle room for all of this, of what we need to do with expenses, and again, a lot of that's related to inflation. So now let me just talk a bit about just our general finances. I don't do this very often, but I, I want to do this this time. So uh, again, the first four months of this year, January through April, Again, we're talking about our budget need. Our budget need was $727,445, all right? But what came in, what came in those four months was actually $579,901.48. Now, I, I think you ought to know, like, our finances have been in such great shape, like, the last five, six years. It's been just tremendous. But the truth is, these past four months have been difficult. That number that you just saw means with that we met our need, only 79.7% of our budget was actually met which is the lowest it's been and I cannot recall. Now, talking with Lisa Curl and Mark Siebert, they kind of helped me see some things here, but one thing in particular, from 
January to the first part of February, 23% of all the giving units of our church, the giving unit, again, there's 340 total one giving units. It could be a person, could be a couple, it could be a family. But of the 23% of all of those, 23% decreased what they were giving. They didn't stop giving, it just, it was lowered down. And once again, it really looks like inflation has a lot to do with that. And then I can, I can see the thought process. I can picture it in my head. You know, Trish and I, you, you can you be talking, oh my goodness, expenses are going up. Man, we don't have an additional cash. We need to find ways to cut costs. And so a lot of times the thought is, well, with what we're giving to God, that's the direction that we'll go. And so I just pray, I just love to speak into you this very moment. Just, would you make a choice to be fearless? Just make a choice. Again, let's do this. I'm going to give to God first. Let's give to him first. Let's do that through his church. And the promise, the promise of God is this, is that he'll take care of you. He will. He will take care of you. I know that from my wife, Trish, and I. He has done that every single time, and that is my, my prayer for all of us. Okay, so that's that. Now, I want to start my message. I want to start my message today by telling you an old Jimmy Stewart joke. Okay, so Jimmy Stewart, you know, I don't know of any of his movies except for that one, but that was a really good one to say the least. Now, I wanted you to know I've told this joke before. I have. It was probably about four years ago, but I have a different reason to tell it. All right, so that's my plea for to do this. So if you've heard it, please don't give the punchline away. If you have not, well, it goes like this. Okay, so this is the joke. So a wife comes to her husband and she says, honey, I'm curious, if I were to die, would you remarry? And he goes, oh, no, 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 I would not do that. No, I don't want anything to do with that. But his wife asks him again the next week, the very same question, if I were to die, would you remarry? He's like, no. She asks him this over and over and over again. It's like another month goes by and she asks the same question again, honey, I'm just curious again, if I were to die, would you remarry? And he goes, okay, maybe I would. Maybe I would, maybe I would end up choosing to get remarried. And she looks at him, looks at him and says, um, I want to, would you let her live in my house? He goes, oh, no, no. Would you let her sleep in my bed? Oh, no, no, no. Would you let her drive my car? Oh, no, no. Would you let her use my golf clubs? And he says, don't be ridiculous. She's left-handed. Is it possible that a joke can be funny and sad all at the same time? And it can also offer perspective. Okay, so here's the thing. That guy's already having an affair. This husband is having an affair. How long has it been going on? Has it been going on for weeks? Has it been going on for months? Has it been going on for years? Does she even know anything about this? It's like, and his whole goal is to keep it quiet, His whole goal is to create this massive secret. What he's doing, he wants to keep hidden. And oh my, does any of that happen to us? Last week I started this brand new series, The Thing Beneath the Thing. And this is based off a book I read. I read Steve Carter's book, The Thing Beneath the Thing. My series is Beware of the Thing, sorry. But that's the book, and I devoured that book. It was really an easy read. So in that book, The Thing, Steve describes it this way. It's this acrostic. It's an acrostic. And the T, the T stands for triggers. Again, triggers. It's the things that's, you know, that's the setup that sets us off. Okay? Now, I want you to see, I want you to meet this person here. I want you to meet, this is Christy Moore. So Christy Moore serves as um, a, an umpire for girls softball 12 and older in the state of Mississippi. And so not long ago, it was only like three or four weeks ago, uh, during a game, Christy made a call at second base, runner slide in, made a call at second base that uh, many, many people did not agree with, especially this one mom. This one mom was there, again, cheering on her daughter, and she was wearing this T-shirt, Mother of the Year. No kidding. And so this mom goes ballistic. She gets triggered by the call. She is so mad. And so she starts yelling and screaming and, you know, obscenities, you know, just shouting all these various things. And eventually, they all make her, I mean, everyone's getting uncomfortable. They make her leave the game, and she has to go out into the parking lot. Okay, and so after the game, the mom comes back, and she cold cocks Christy right in the side of the head. She punches her, and then the police come and arrest her. Do you know now, right now, there's four states in the United States, four states they're saying that if you punch an official or an umpire, it will be considered a felony. And you know, I don't know, something seems to say that's the right thing to do. 
It's the right thing to do. She made a comment in the news after this was all over with. She made this statement. The verbal abuse and even now the physical abuse. Enough is enough. It gets harder and harder to staff these tournaments because no one wants to listen to the verbal abuse and then run the risk of what happened to me happening to them. So let me just ask you, let's just really get right out. You know I mean, is this something, do you get triggered by your kids' sports games? Because these are the things that are happening. They're, they're truly happening. And I pray that you and I would re- really begin to grasp what's honestly going on, you know, in our society. Again, the fact of the matter is that triggers, triggers are internal sensitivities. Triggers typically strike a nerve. Again, that was a bad call. That was a terrible call. And that trigger then can be, it can strike a nerve, but then it can lead you to actually strike a person. It can. It often does. All right, now, let's talk about this. This mom that's, that got upset, the one that was wearing the Mother of the Year t-shirt, Something tells me there's something deeper going down. There's deeper, something's happening inside that person. Okay, Let, let's do this. Let's talk. Have you ever uh, driven over a pothole before? Raise your hand for me. If you live in the state of Ohio, come on. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, you try your best. But yeah, you saw that picture, you know, a pothole. Again, they are all over. Again, they happen. It's true. Now, what, you know, not every pothole is the same pothole. So again, how does this happen? Uh, water gets into the asphalt, and then it expands and freezes, forcing the asphalt out, and it comes out in chunks. But you can honestly fix a lot of those relatively easy by putting in more asphalt. But some potholes, it's just not true. Some of them have been created, and it's deep down. It's like an underground water source, a water pipe. It could be a sewer pipe. It's broken, and there's no way to fix it unless you go down deep. You've got to go down deep and take care of what's below it. Steve Carter, in his book, he makes this statement about this. He says, if they try to patch this type of pothole without first solving the thing beneath it, causing the damage, the cavity will erode. We all have potholes in our life stories. Markings of long-ago emotional pain caused by the hurtful words of behaviors of others. Never underestimate the power of an old wound. Like, let's say, your husband having an affair and keeping it a secret. Now, I'm just wondering, can you imagine, can you imagine your spouse, husband or wife, having this secret affair? Or maybe you're like today, Greg, I don't have to imagine, it actually happened to me. It happened to me. And then you can see how easy it would be for this person to be so absolutely triggered. Triggered. It's like, oh my goodness. I mean, marriage is a joke. Men are jerks, you know. There is no way. I will never, ever let anyone get close to me ever again because they hurt my heart so bad. You see how this all happens? Now, I found this as I was reading through Steve Carter's book. He said this. He talked about triggers. Typically, uh, three things are created, all right? Typically from triggers. And we'll show them for you here. So first, usually what happens after we're triggered is that we hide and pretend, or we become insecure, or we make up stories to help, help them feel better. We make up stories to help ourselves feel better, and usually it's stories about other people. I want to look at the first one here. I want to talk about this hiding and pretending. Now remember again the acrostic, the acrostic thing. thing. So the T stands for triggers, but the H, the H stands out for hideouts. It's hideouts. It's places we go to escape pain. These can be real places that we go to. They can be metaphorical, imaginary, whatever. But we go to these places to just escape the things that are going happening in our lives. Let me just give you a few examples, okay? One might be food. I go to food because the fact of the matter is that food just makes me feel better. It just does. I mean, when I'm struggling, man, I get a big old bowl of ice cream. I mean, this, I just go to food. Maybe for you, it would be like a bar. It'd be like in your basement where there's tons of alcohol. I just have a lot of alcohol. And so again, when I'm struggling, when I'm hurting, I just drink. I drink. Remember, we just did, we just did communion, and we celebrated. We remembered the blood of Jesus. We drank to remember. A lot of people drink to forget. It's like, what are you going to do this weekend? Man, I'm going to go get wasted. Why? Well, maybe it's just because, or maybe it's like, well, I've just got so much pain, I've got so much struggle, I just, just, just want to forget everything. Maybe. 
Another uh, hideout for people could, could be this, online shopping. I mean, it's like, again, it's like, again, it's this false god of Amazoning. I mean, literally, it's like when I go buy something online, when I buy something, it just makes me, there's this euphoria. I just love it. I love it when it comes in the mail. And then when, it's, you know, when it happens another five to seven days later, I got to buy something else because I just got to keep having this thing. This is how I deal with my pain and my shame. It could be a gym. It could be, and notice that these hideouts are not necessarily bad places. They're not bad places. A gym isn't bad at all. But you have to ask the question, what's the point of the exercise? Are you exercising only, only because, well, there's this deep hurt, this deep shame, this something, this old wound, and you're trying to cover it up? You know, it could actually be church. It could be church. I pray that all of us, if you believe and trust in Jesus, I pray you never call yourself a church attender. This is not about church attending. This is about engaging God in worship because we love him with everything that we have. But a lot of times, people, we end up coming to church. We come to church again, want to engage in God. But, but the same breath, I also, man, I, I just want to hide and pretend. I want people to think that I have it all together. Can we all just say it? None of us have it all together. No one has it all together. Stop pretending like we do. One time I was talking to a counselor, and so this counselor made a statement to me that was very helpful, very helpful. So she said this. This is the statement that she made. She said, what is in the dark grows, and what comes out into the light shrinks. That if you keep something in the dark, it's just going to get worse and worse. But if you let it, if you let, if you get it out into the open, It is amazing what God can do, how he can change our story, change our lives, all right? And I'll tell you what, you you know, we can do this. We can hide things and hide things. I mean, it's like, uh, who wants to expose, who wants to air their dirty laundry? I mean, I don't really want to do that. I'll say, what do you want to do today? If that's not it, I don't want to, you know, expose the things, you know, but again, if we choose to do it, we receive freedom. And I tell you, there is an example in the Old Testament of a person who chose to hide his sin, and we have got to look at it now. Open your Bibles, if you would please, smartphones, either way, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. That's where we're going to be today. You can connect that direction, or if you'd like, you can just simply follow on the screen, and I'll show you the scriptures in the order that we have them presented. So let's talk about this. In the Old Testament, you have these two books. Again, it used to be one just Samuel, but there's two books, First and Second Samuel. First Samuel, again, is all about a man named Samuel. I mean, it is. Again, Hannah can't have a child. She prays to God, prays to God, just give me a boy, and I promise I'll give him to you, and she does. And so Samuel serves as a prophet, priest, as a judge. And again, then we see the reign and the decline of Israel's first king. This is King Saul. And then we see the choice of a, of, of a new king, King David, and that would be considered Israel's greatest king. Then you get into 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is interesting because it's primarily all about King David's successes, his military successes, but it's also about his struggles, the struggles that King David had. And one of his biggest struggles was lust. It was lust. Now, again, watching online or here in person, you'd be like, oh, Greg, uh, that's not a topic for me And that makes me just want to laugh. Because you know that lust, in a lot of ways, is very much like greed. Both of them have the same definition. Wanting moreishness. I just want more. So something tells me this is exactly the topic we need to look at. So let's get into this now. We're getting into 2 Samuel now. I'm going to start in chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse 1. So it says here the text. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. So two comments off that verse. The Ammonites, David did something. The Ammonites, again, good people, and David sent a delegation to them because their king, King Hanun, had died. And he sent a delegation to express his condolences, and they responded to his kindness with violence. And so there's a war, a war takes place, and unfortunately, the Ammonites, they're all gone. All right, they're, they're taken away, basically, because of this war. So now, scholars believe that King David is around 50 years of age at the time of what we're talking about. And David is where he is not supposed to be. 
Remember, he's at the palace when he should be out with his military commanders. This is where he should be. Personally, when I think of King David right now, I think his theme song is a stick song called Too Much Time in My Hands. Because King David has way too much time on his hands. And because of that, it takes him, puts him into places where he ought not to be, all right? And so, and honestly, again, when you think about sin, sin comes, it does. Again, temptation comes to us. And oftentimes, there's a lot of collateral damage. Again, we don't just sin in isolation. Again, understand that temptation is not a sin, but when it leads us this way, it can cause a lot of problems. David is where he should not be. Let's keep reading. This is verses 2 and 3. 2 and 3. One evening, David got up from his bed. Again, he cannot sleep and walked around the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful So David sent someone to find out about her, and the man said she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now what that servant says to him is very clever. It really is, because most times genealogies never included the husband. It's always about the the father, the grandfather, the great-grandfather. But this servant is being kind to David. He's trying to tell him something without telling him. I mean, clearly he's like, David, I want you to know this woman. He knows that David is about to do something stupid. He's about to do something really dumb. He's like, David, I just want you to know that this is uh, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. This woman is a married woman. She is married. Now, David, please, he's like, don't go do something stupid. You already have four wives now. Please, whatever you do, whatever you're thinking, the last thing you want to do is to just go ahead and do it. Don't do this. But I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Isn't it crazy sometimes when you and I face temptation? When we face temptation, we literally like get into this little trance, this trance. Honestly, I mean, we, we become selfish with, t- with temptation. Oftentimes we become apathetic. I don't care. I don't care what happens. All David can think about, he's totally consumed with having sex with this woman. He is. And because of that, he's, his thoughts are, oh, there's no way she'll get pregnant. No way. I mean, it's not going to happen. Well, sometimes it does. Let's just talk about that in regards to all temptation, all temptation, not just that one. I mean, how about this? How about um, drinking and driving? How about driving a car and texting at the same time? The thought is, oh, the possibilities of me getting in trouble, me hurting another person, they're so low, so low, and yet it does. It happens. Um, I want to tell you this. So uh, maybe you've heard of a place called Milligan College. So Milligan College was at Johnson City, Milligan College, Tennessee. And I heard this first from Becky Medley. Becky told me, but I looked up and contacted the, the, well, I looked at the school website. And so back in April, um, so there's a cross country and track runner by the name of Eli Comer. Eli Comer, 20 years of old, a sophomore. So again, this, was, uh, this is ultimately what happened to him. But he was out running. This was in Virginia. He was running with three other classmates and, a, and a, an assistant coach. And a person was driving a car, and um, they, they were under the influence. And they end up hitting Eli and two other students. And the, the very sad thing about it is that Eli passed away, and his funeral was on April 5th, um, all, all because of an accident that in, in many ways, you know, there's, there's accidents and tragedies, but for some of them, they should never, ever happen. They should not happen, but that's exactly what happened. It happened here, and it's going to happen with David. So let's look. Let's see what happens. I'm going to take you into verses 4 and 5 now. 4 and 5. Then David sent messengers to get her, to get Bathsheba. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Again, The whole thing, she's dealing with her period, and Leviticus tells us that he should stay away from her. Then she went back home, and the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Again, there's no other way to think about this. In most cases, this was a one-night stand. It's just a one-night stand. Again, And you know, the thought, the, the words, I'm pregnant, can be so very exciting, so very exhilarating, and the words, I'm pregnant, can also be absolutely terrifying and life altering. And so now we have to ask the question, how is David going to respond? How is David going to respond to those words? All right, I'm going to take you into verse 6. Verse 6 says this, so David sent word to Joab. The truth of the matter is, is that he should have sent word to God. But he didn't. Because all he can think about is keeping this thing quiet. 
I gotta keep it quiet. No one needs to know. This all has to be done in secret. Remember, what's in the dark grows. What comes out in the light shrinks even more so. It can be forgiven. Again, if David, if David, what he should have done is confess. If he would have just said, Almighty God, I'm wrong. This was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. I mean, it would, everything would have changed. I, I want you to see something. I, I'm going to quote this Seth Andrews. Seth Andrews made this statement. He said, I continue to be amazed when I see Christian women defending a Bible that denigrates women. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to do that at all. I'm not doing that, not in the least. The fact of the matter is, is that what David did right here is wrong. It's wrong. And no woman, no woman should have been treated that way that day. No woman should be treated that way today. Again, no one is applauding David for what he's doing now. We'll applaud him when he makes the choice to actually humble himself and come before God. I mean, this, if this wasn't bad enough, he tries to cover it up, and it only makes it worse. I mean, what we will do, what length we will go to hide, to hide what we've done. Let me tell you what he does. David tells Joab, bring Uriah back home. Bring him back here. So he does. David brings him into the palace, and he tells him very clearly, hey, let's eat, let's drink. Now I want you to go home, go home, sleep with your wife, because if he does that, well, that will cover up the pregnancy. No one will know. Everyone will think it's Uriah's baby, all right? But he won't do it. Uriah's noble and loyal. I won't do it. David brings him back the second day, the, very, the next day, and let's eat and drink. He drinks so much. Uriah drinks so much, he gets drunk, and he tells him again, Uriah, go home, go home, sleep with the wife. He won't do it. So now David is forced to do the unthinkable. It just cannot imagine that this would happen, but it does. This is found in verse 14, 14 of chapter 11. It says, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. Uriah is literally carrying his own death sentence. In it he wrote, put Uriah out front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. And that is exactly what happens. Uriah dies, and now David breathes this big old sigh of relief. My problem's over. The issue is done and taken care of. He takes Bathsheba, brings him into the palace. She becomes wife number five, and he can literally like wipe his hands thinking, everything's going to be fine. But 2 Samuel 11 ends with this verse. This is how it ends. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. He did something that he knew he should not do, and then he kept it hidden. I just don't want anyone ever to find out. So here's what what God does. God sends the prophet Nathan to David, and let's understand, God sent Jesus to all of us. And Jesus is ultimately a descendant of King David. Again, but, but God sends Nathan to David, and Nathan tells David a story, a story that's really quite amazing, and, here's, and it's so effective. So this is in chapter 12. It goes like this. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. And David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He said he must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you are the man. You're the man who had no pity whatsoever, not on Bathsheba, not even on Uriah. Again, David is the man who who kept his sin. He hid his sin. And hiding our sin never works. So the question is, what does work? And it's called confession. We confess it, confess it. We just tell God what happened. Again, when Bathsheba said, I'm pregnant, David had the opportunity to do what's right and confess to God, I'm so sorry. Then he could have gone to Bathsheba and to Uriah and apologized, this isn't right. And who knows, Uriah may have been willing to raise the boy as his own, his own son. But we won't ever know because David kept his his sin hidden. See, this is the big so what. It's like, what's the point of all this? Don't hide your sin from God. All of us, all of us, we all have, this is the possibility for each and every one of us. But what we should do instead is to repent. Repent means this. 
Repent means to change your mind and your heart. I'm going to change the course and the direction of my life. We abandon the old to, ex- to experience the new. We receive forgiveness. Did you know that with this incident, with Bathsheba, David has two psalms in particular that speak to us about his sin. Psalm 51 and Psalm 36. In Psalm 51, we see truly what is true repentance. What is it? And it means this. True, true repentance means asking God to give you what you need the most. And what we need the most is mercy. God, I need your mercy. Because this means we always have hope. There's always hope that God, please give me your mercy in, in this moment. In Psalm 51, David said this. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And that's the promise that God, for anyone who comes to him, that he will truly do this. He will give us mercy and compassion. But it's not just this too. True repentance also means that there's an admission. There's an admission. I admit it. I admit what I did was wrong. And I want mercy. I want forgiveness. This we see in Psalm 32. Look what he says. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to you, Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That's the promise of God. That's the promise of Jesus, that if we come before him, he does. He promises to forgive us. You understand, David is our example. Our example, and it's this, again, there are consequences for what we do when we decide to go out of the will of God. There are consequences, but Jesus, Jesus is our our exception. He's our exception. Look at what it says in Kings. I want you to see this last verse. For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. David is not perfect. Not by any means. Neither are any of us. But Jesus is. Jesus is perfect. And that's why I put my hope in him. Have you? Do you know him? I mean, have you, do you know him? Do you love him? All of us. All of us. There's no exception for any of us. I just pray that you, you put your trust in him. Remember, again, what's in the dark grows. But what comes out in the light is forgiven. Call out to God today. Don't hide it. Tell him about it and watch him totally change your life, including your testimony. God and Father, we come to you this day. I thank you, God, for the mercy and grace that's found in your son, Jesus. I thank you, God, for your word that teaches us that we have all these examples. They're all good and bad. We thank you, God, truly for showing us in David's life about what to do and what not to do. God, you don't want us to hide. You don't. You don't want us to hide our sin. You want us to confess it. And when we do, we receive mercy. God, speak to us right now. God, reveal to us, to all of us, what's really deep in our hearts. What are the things that trigger us, that often push us to hide out? Speak to us this day. And I pray that we would truly change because of our trust in you. Guide and direct us, God, this very moment. May we act on what you say. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. Would you stand Stand out as we begin our invitation? As you stand, I just want to extend the invitation. This is just our time to reflect on what you've heard, maybe what the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do in this time. Um, so we invite you to sing or come forward and pray. There are prayer requests along both sides of the platform. So join in as you feel led.
down. Oh, there it is. Okay. I'd like to introduce to you, this is uh, Betty Myers Miller, okay? You're with Don Miller. And uh, Betty would like to come and to uh, become part of our church family. Would you give her a round of applause for that? I just want to ask you two questions, two questions. First of all, do you believe that Jesus is God's one and only son? I do. And do you accept him as your personal Lord and Savior? I do. Very good. We welcome you into this church family. Again, a round of applause for Betty. Let me, uh, let me have a quick word of prayer here for Don and Betty as, uh, as she joins our church family. Lord God, we love you so much. We're so thankful, God, for Betty that she is here and, and joining our church and being a part of this fellowship, Lord. I pray that we uh, love on her and accept her, Father, and she can do great things, Father, um, in this place. So thankful, God, for Don and his health and, God, seeing them together, it is such a blessing. We love you, Jesus, so much. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Welcome, Betty and Dee. That's a great Sunday, of course. Um, if you're a regular tender here of Westville Christian Church and you have offering with you today, you can drop that in the plates on your way out. You can always go to our website, wcchurch.info, to give online, or you can text the word give to 614-881-4246. As it is the first Sunday in May, we have a new place of hope this month, and that is Caring for Kids. This is a ministry um, that we have supported before. Many of you know Ben Thompson. He now works for Caring for Kids, and it's an organization that helps support families who foster kids and foster kids um, in central Ohio. And so that is our place of hope this month. That means when you fill out a digital connect card, we will, um, for the first time, we will make a $5 donation to Caring for Kids in your name. We also like to support our place of hope as a church body. Um, and this month, we are doing something with Caring for Kids. I, this is a little card. It's in the cart in the lobby. If you want to pick one up, there's a QR code here. Um, and it, it helps you reach um, a website where you can support a birthday party. I want to read the back of this card to you because it's, it's just really profound and kind of gives you an idea of why we support um, this ministry. Before I came into foster care, I did not know about birthday parties. A birthday was just a normal day and we never celebrated them at all. I never even knew it was my birthday. I was disappointed when I would hear other kids talk about how exciting and fun their birthday celebration had been and they would describe their surprise when they received that special present that they had really wanted for their birthday. I never had a story of my own to tell. Then, I would really begin to miss those birthday moments and memories, what I did not have and never really knew, all the birthdays I missed, the friends celebrating with me, the cake and the presents. It was very exciting to have my very first birthday party. I was 11. I had all my friends there and there was a pinata and cake and even balloons. It was so fun. It meant so much. It meant my new parents cared about me and wanted to let me know I am special and I am loved. And that's from Liliana. And she was a foster child um, who was ministered to through caring for kids. So this month, uh, we're asking or collecting new toys in about a $25 to $30 value. You can place those in the crate that's in the lobby. Or you can pick up one of these cards, scan the QR code, and you can give financially directly to caring for kids. And this goes to support birthday celebrations for those kiddos. And again, just in her own words, it's a way that we show God's love and show that people are thinking about them and caring for them. If you are new to Westerville Christian Church or you've not yet attended a starting point, starting point is happening today. It's a place where you can learn more about what happens here at Westerville Christian Church and maybe what your next steps are to getting involved. That will be today at 1130 in the Fireside Room. Don't worry, you don't have to have signed up beforehand. If you'd like to attend, we would love to have you. Lunch is provided. Again, that's 1130 in the Fireside Room. I hope you have a terrific first week of May. We'll see you next week.